so sorry about that. So we're going to continue our study on the book of Philippians. And so we are here at chapter 3. And but before we start, I, I did want to ask everyone, you ever heard that expression, um, it's to die for? Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, you, you hear that once in a while. And, and usually, generally speaking, it, it's saying that uh, something pertaining to something great or something awesome, something good. Like, for example, if you see like an incredible performance, right, and then someone's like, oh, how was that performance? And you simply reply, it's to die for. Right, um, or if if uh, you know, like me, everyone knows pretty much here that I love food. You know, there's no denying that truth. And I really enjoy food, and one of my favorite things is uh, red velvet cupcakes. Right, and everyone knows where the best place to get red velvet cupcakes: cookie jar. All right, so everyone that's right across the bridge, you guys had red velvet cupcakes, and I remember this one time we went over to. Uh, one of our friends' house, they were having a party, and another friend of ours, who's never had cookie jar red velvet cupcakes, has it. And so his response is, wow, this is to die for, or it's to die for, as he like to say. And um, I know it's just an expression, and really it's just one of those things that, that people say, but have you really ever asked yourself, you know, What's something that you really think is worth dying for? You ever think, and it's like, yeah, I'm willing to die for this cause, or, or yes, I'm willing to die for this person. What are the things that you're willing to die for? You know, in Matthew 16, Jesus, when speaking to his disciples, he says this, and then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So we need to start asking ourselves, what is it that we value? What is it that we most desire in life? What, is it the, what are the things that we're willing to die for? It also reminds me of, in that same book, in Matthew, you know, just a couple chapters later, we have a rich, young ruler coming to Jesus. And he says, Jesus, you know, how can I enter into the kingdom of heaven? How can I be a part of the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, well, you follow the commandments, and, you know, you do, you do, and, and the rich, young ruler says, you know, I've, I follow the commandments to a T. You know, I don't murder, I don't steal, I'm, a, I'm an awesome guy. And so Jesus, in response, he simply says, well, then go sell your belongings and then follow me. And without even responding, the rich young ruler just, just says he walks away full of sorrow. You see, he was not willing to let go of his riches in order to follow Christ. And now in the passage that we're actually going to look at today, we see the opposite is true of Paul. We see Paul as someone who expresses his one true desire is really just to know Christ more and more, to know him in a more and intimate way. And last week we studied about how prior to salvation, all Paul pursued was this self-righteousness in order to look good in front of people and, and, and to feel like he's, he's accomplishing a lot for God. And, and he feels like he's, he's, he's crediting all this righteousness into his account and then he realizes in verses 7, 8, and 9, and it was worth nothing. He says, but I count all that as lost when compared to the Im immeasurable richness of, of knowing who Jesus is. And he comes here in verses 10 and 11. So I'm going to ask everyone to rise as we read verses 10 and 11. And I'm going to read from the ESV. It says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Dear God, we are unworthy to even open up your word. And yet you've graced us with the Holy Spirit to be able to understand it, to be able to approach it, and to be able to learn from it, and be humbled by it. And so we pray right now, Lord God, that... You just do an amazing work. 
Use me, Lord God, as your instrument. And may you get all honor, glory, and praise, please. And all this is a prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone, you may be seated. This has to be one of my favorite passages, if not my favorite passage in all of Scripture. Simply because it's describing this type of desire to want to know Jesus. It's describing Paul's heart of, of, of him just wanting, wanting more of Jesus. Nothing else, he just wants Jesus. And, and Paul, in these two verses, really sums up how everything he does in his life, everything he does, he pursues for the purpose of getting to know Jesus intimately, of getting to know him just more and more. And if you realize, it's been 30 years now since he had that Damascus Road experience. It's been 30 years now since Jesus appeared to him and he first calls him my Lord. And so for 30 years now, he's been just serving him. And wherever the Lord is leading him, he's been going. He, he's had his fair share of struggles. He's been beaten countless times. He's been imprisoned. He's been shipwrecked. He's been stoned and left for dead. So it's been 30 years of serving Christ, and yet he's still saying his desire is to know him more. And so Paul's heart here is one who truly reflects that Jesus is really, in his perspective, to die for. And so he's willing to die for this purpose of knowing him. And that's what he expresses in these two verses. And how I kind of want to unwrap these two verses is I want us to be able to portray and see Jesus in the light of who he really is. And in his worthiness. And so I want to be able for us to answer this question. Is he worth dying for? Through our justification, through our sanctification, and finally through our glorification. And so first let's look at our justification. So let's look at verse 10. And in verse 10 he writes this simple phrase. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He says that I may know him. That I may know him. And in the New Testament, Paul uses this word, know, multiple times to describe our salvation. For example, in Ephesians 1.17, he says, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So it's this idea of knowing him, this revelation of who he is. In 1 Timothy 1.12, he says, Which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. This idea of he knows what, who, who he's serving. He knows Jesus in his intimate way. Now this word carries a deeper meaning to those Gentiles that were sitting in the congregation. Now you remember the makeup of this church. It was very mixed. There was a lot of Jews and there was a lot of Gentiles in this Philippian church. Kind of like there's a lot of Jews and Gentiles here in our Filipino church. Anyway. That was bad. <laughs> okay, yeah, moving along. So, it, 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 to the Gentile mindset, much of them came from this pagan background, right? And so, they, they, they had this practice where the word that he uses here is gnosis. And so, in order to reach this, this level of gnosis, this intimate level of knowing this higher creature, what they would do is they would literally just get drunk. They would just drink and drink and drink until they reach this status where they feel like they're hallucinating and they feel like they can know God in this deeper level. In, in, in other pagan cultures, they, 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 they also practice, um, you guys know what Gnostics are, right? Yes. And so in their mentality of this Gnosticism and mysticism, it's like they needed to, to unlock this deeper level of mystery, that same word, gnosis, in order to know this higher being again in a deeper level. And so when Paul says this word, it automatically, in their minds, when he says he knows him, he knows it's not just this, like this, he knows him, like I know Barack Obama, but it's this deeper, intimate level of I know him. It's this striving to want to know him and really know him. In the same sense, to the, to the Jewish mindset, this word, Genosko, again, coming from the Jewish background, to those in the congregation, they understand that this word is the Greek equivalent for the Jewish, the Hebrew word, yada. And now this word, it carries a deeper meaning because it means this union of love. Kind of like how Adam knew Eve and Eve bore him sons. Or in Amos, 
3, 2, where he says, when speaking to the chosen nation of Israel, he says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now, obviously, God 